Hi, this is Phil Simon of the Huffington Post, and I am pleased today to be joined by Steve Hogarth, the lead singer of one of my favorite bands, Marillion. We're going to talk about the music industry, about the new album, and whatever else comes up. Steve, how are you doing today, buddy? I'm fine, thank you. Yes, I'm in Cardiff, uh, about to start the UK tour. Sound check will be in two hours. I'm dreading it. It'll sound like a car crash, um, and it'll be a lot of hard work. But okay. apart from that, I'm fine. You guys have never sounded like a car crash. <laughs> um, so the new album, Marillion's 17th proper effort, is called Sounds That Can't Be Made. Do you think it's more of a departure or evolution from the band's most recent efforts? Well, hopefully it's a departure and hopefully it's, a, it's an evolution in the sense that we've, we've kind of evolved by departing to date anyway. <laughs> um, we, we've made a conscious effort at least by our own standards, not to stay the same from one album to the next. Um, you know, people sometimes say, why haven't you split up yet? And I say, well, you know, the reason a band stays together a long time is, is it, or, or, or to, the inverse of that, the, the, what splits bands up is um, a lack of forgiveness <laughs> on a personal level. Um, we're, we're quite forgiving people, uh, but but more importantly, um, create. You know, if you feel you're in a rut creatively, then at some point you're going to have to run away from it. Um, and we've not really. We're in the fortunate position that creatively we can kind of do what we like, um, and we have the freedom to take take on new um, forms of inspiration. Go go to new places musically. Uh, I have total freedom lyrically to write about anything I like. You know, no, no one in the band tells me what to write and not write. Um, so you know, we we take each album as an opportunity to try and and redefine ourselves. And uh, the opening track on this album, Gaza, is a, a foray into Arabic um, melodies and Arabic rhythms. Um, Along with everything else, it's, 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 it would be a simplification to say it's Arabic because it's, it, it's moving around musically all the time. Um, but we've not really been in that area much before, and that was quite interesting, Al although the, the subject matter of the song has turned it into the major headache of the, of the, well, probably of my career, the major headache of my career, because... I feel a great weight of responsibility upon me for 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 saying what I've said, and and I also feel a a, a monstrous need for it to be right, for it to be factually correct, uh, and uh, and you know what right as an English white boy to comment on Gaza, for instance, you know you have to make sure that you're not saying anything naive and and stupid and. So, um, yeah, that involved an awful lot of research and it, it continues to be a major headache. I know, I know I'm going to rain down all kinds of criticism upon myself for that song. But it is a great song and it's a very different song. Um, and um, Paul, my love for, for example, you know, to, to move on, is, is, is not really like anything we've ever done before. It reminds me of the Isley Brothers and Prince and... Um, who else? Maybe um, um, Todd Rundgren a little bit as well. So, so there's, they're all influences I've never really applied to anything we've done before. Sounds that can't be made as a song isn't really like anything we've ever done. So, so and and the sky above the rain um, is perhaps a little bit more Beach Boys. Than, than anywhere we've been before, or there's, there's, it feels like there's, there's a ghost of Brian Wilson in there somewhere. So um, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty pleased with this record. It's nearly killed us making it, but, but now it's, it's done. Um, I'm very happy with it. Well, you mentioned a lot of artists and bands, Steve, and even in the opening song, Gaza, which is the only one on the new album I've heard, uh, there uh, are a lot of layers to it uh, musically and, and lyrically. Um, definitely has an epic feel. Did you and the band make a concerted effort to write about Palestine and the situation in the Middle East, or did that just come across uh, randomly? You know, I'm not, I'm not entirely sure how it came together. 
I had started writing words about um, about Gaza and the situation there, um, and the more I've 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 read and heard about the situation in Gaza, the more I felt that someone, you know, well, that, that I should 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 open my big mouth and say something because we, we, we have a lot of trust out there now amongst our fans and I think that um, if I open my mouth and say something they don't necessarily agree with it but they'll go and check it out and they'll probably get online and open some newspapers and start start to explore why, why is Steve H suddenly on about this place you know what's really going on there what's what's upset him um, so it's a so it's a way. What I'm hoping the song will do is just raise awareness of 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 what's going on in Gaza, what what Gazans are having to endure, and then beyond that, perhaps people will get into reading about the history. Um, it's not an anti-Jewish song. I, I must stress that uh, uh, there's there's hardly anything if you scrutinise the song carefully that condemns. Uh, even the state of Israel. There's very little condemnation of the state of Israel in that song, we, and, and that's, that's not really how I feel. What I do feel is that it's a situation which is worsening, and the world needs to get to get in there and do something about that. There, 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 there is. It, it's just plain wrong that a child should be growing up in a refugee camp that is a gr a, a grandchild or a great grandchild. Of of a person who who moved who was moved to somewhere temporarily, which is how come those camps were were set up. Um, it's just not right that um, 60 years on that that situation hasn't been resolved peacefully. And uh, uh, you know, the more people are thinking about it and understand the situation, that can only be a, a force for good in the world, as far as I'm concerned. Mm -hmm. You mentioned before, Steve, that uh, Marillion has a great deal of trust with its fans. I've noticed that over the years, the band has really utilized the internet to directly reach your fans, and in some cases, you've successfully financed the making of new albums. Uh, quick question, why aren't more bands doing this? Well, they must be crazy. <laughs> <laughs> because it is the way to go. Um, it's not an easy path to tread. It involves you doing a lot more than being a musician, um, which, of course, most musicians don't want to do. Mo mo most people got into a band so they wouldn't have to do mundane work. Um, but uh, I think mundane work, you know, is going to be with you whether you like it or not at some point in your life, and, and you've, you've got to take the rough with the smooth. I mean, we have the Americans ready to thank for... For the whole internet thing that that we embraced, because um, the Americans brought it to us. Uh, the, the our American fans, or some of our American fans, started up a tour fund and raised a lot of money so we could go and play in the USA uh, back in 1997. Um, and this this shocked us. You know, I, the first I knew about it, they already had sixty thousand dollars in a bank account that I didn't know anyone had even set up. Mm -hmm. um, to give us a big bag of money to go and tour America, and we just thought, what's going on here? What's this? What is this internet thing? Because <laughs> we didn't really know. I certainly had no idea. Um, and most people in Europe in 1997 thought the internet was some weird thing that people did in their sheds, you know, if they had a computer. <laughs> they, they really didn't think of it or imagine it would become part of everyday life in the way that it has in no time at all. Um, so we were we were fortunate that uh, the American Tour Fund woke us up to the fact that whatever the internet was, we'd better get onto it. And secondly, that um, our fans would put their money where their hearts and mouths were, you know, no problem. Uh, uh, and and it, it woke us up to the fact that we didn't really need a record label. Um, we could do everything. I mean, we were also sick of going into... Uh, we're signing deals and going into record companies and shaking hands with kids who were younger than us and knew less about the music business than we did, mm -hmm. you know, and you'd be shaking hands with these guys and thinking, um, I'm sure he's very nice, but uh, I'm not sure I want to place my balls in the palm of his hand right. uh, because they're probably safer in mine. Um, 
so that was the first thing. We, we, we realized that our co the five of us, our collective knowledge of the music business w was probably beyond the knowledge of people who we were starting to work with. Um, and secondly, then we thought, well, what do we need these record companies for? Well, they give us a big advance, um, and that keeps us going. So the, the only thing that was missing was the big advance. And then the realization that we could just ask the fans to buy the album we haven't even recorded yet um, was really the, the, the key that unlocked it all. I mean, if you're a new band, um, then obviously you don't enjoy, uh, you don't enjoy a database of, of 50,000 fans and so things are trickier. But things were always tricky, you know, in the old days, getting a record deal, deal might take you 10 years, of rattling around in a van and gigging around. Mm -hmm. uh, so I would argue and suspect perhaps, that if you're in a band which is good, and that of course is the crux, you have to be good. Uh, you have to be very good at what you, you, you do, and by good what I mean is you have to be making music which moves people on some level. Um, you have to be saying something either with your music or your words which knocks people out, and, and if you do, if that's what you're doing, then every time you play anywhere, people will get off what, on what you do. And if they're getting off on what you do, they will want to support you. And so if you say from the stage every night, I hope you enjoyed what you heard tonight, ladies and gentlemen, please put your email address in a bucket on the way out. Um, you know, we won't send you any spam, we won't sell this email address on, we won't abuse the privilege of, of owning your email address, but we will keep you informed as to what we're doing next. Now, if you'd just seen a band that you thought was amazing, that you knew were young and, and uh, just getting off the ground, you know, and you, you, you had the excitement of feeling like you'd just witnessed, you know, some brilliant thing uh, in the making, um, you'd want to be part of that and you'd want to know what, what it was doing next. And, and I think over a 10-year period, if you're working hard and gigging around, you can probably build up a, a fairly... Um, respectable database and those people will support you if they're genuinely thrilled and excited by what you're doing. Yeah, so the, that's, author, the author oh. Seth Godin calls them tribes. Pardon? The author Seth Godin wrote a book about it, he calls them tribes. Yes, well we, I mean human beings are, are tribal at the very uh, the very core, which is what causes all bloody trouble in the world, but it's, <laughs> but it's also a very you know positive thing too. Sure, sure. Well, you talked before about the difference between some of the more mature bands that have taken 10 years or more to build an established fan base and some of the newer bands. More generally, Steve, what's your take on the state of the industry, uh, music industry and its future? Um, well, it's obviously changing uh, almost by the second. Uh, you know, I've watched all the major labels come crushing down and watched them moving out of their shiny high-rise buildings in London and taking up uh, ever more modest premises. Um, so it's definitely changing. Um, CD sales are in free fall. Our CD sales are in free fall, just the same. You know, so people are, um, I, I mean, I can only suspect that, that people are uh, getting to listen to their music and are, and are becoming, are starting to expect that they should listen to their music for free rather than paying for it. No one's going to pay for anything they don't have to, really, are they? Um, if cars were free, you'd probably go and get a free one, wouldn't you? If, the, if, you just, if it just involved walking to the end of the street, putting the keys in and driving away, um, you'd probably you'd probably do that if if, if it was legal. And uh, okay, music piracy isn't legal, but no one's exactly going to arrest you for it either. So. You can't blame people for stealing music, and so I think, from my own perception, um, it's like it exists on two levels. It exists on a kind of do-it-yourself level and exploit the internet and do it all in-house, which is what we're doing, and then it exists on that other kind of get into do a deal with Simon Cowell. Uh, and get into a, a kind of talent show thing and do it do it that way. That, that's kind of how it is in the UK. I'm probably not the best person to comment on on the music business and and how it how it's how it works in the USA because I really have no idea. But I can see, 
I can see a time in the future where it becomes more about subscription and licensing, you know, and you, you don't actually buy anything anymore. You, you just kind of pay a license fee and it comes to you. Um, I can imagine a situation where you go down the, to your local store and you buy some black box which connects to your TV screen and your loudspeakers and that's that. You get up in the morning and you walk downstairs and you say, I want to hear, reach out, I'll be there by the four tops. And it comes out the speakers and then you say, that was great, I'd like to watch Apocalypse Now. And it comes up on the screen. Uh, how you then, you know, whether, whether such a system can then automate ha paying royalties to the producers of, uh, of that content that you're watching and listening to is another thing. I mean, I see no reason why it can't be automated and why you couldn't automatically be paid for something that people hear or see. I mean, that's not, that's not, I mean, it's complicated, but it's, it is rocket science, but it's not rocket science mm -hmm. beyond, uh, beyond our capability. I think there's so many vested interests, though, in not paying musicians for their work that um, perhaps people are dragging their heels a little bit over over putting the technology in place to make automa automated uh, royalty payments work. Mm -hmm. On my uh, website, I took some queries from fans, and I'm going to throw a few questions at you fr directly from some Aurelian fans. Uh, who inspires you as an artist? Oh, um... I don't know. I, I don't know if I am inspired that much by artists anymore. I, okay. You know, Neil Armstrong inspired me. Uh, yeah, I Nelson, saw that on the Facebook page. Yeah, Nelson Mandela inspires me. You know, pe pe people who um, people who I guess put 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 a mission ahead of their own well-being. You know, put 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 the world beyond. You know, put 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 the world. Further up, further up the uh, pecking order than their own egos uh, are my inspiration. W w whether or not they're uh, musicians, um, I don't know. I mean, it, it, it's funny. Over time, you know, if you'd have asked me a few years ago, I would have told you that the Blue Nile are, are a, a huge inspiration, and Paul Buchanan, the singer from the Blue Nile, is. Is, is a huge inspiration, or I would have said Paddy McAloon from Prefab Sprout is a huge inspiration. But you know, and John Lennon, of course, and David Bowie, of course. Uh, but you know, at the end of the day, that they, they they made um, there's a lot of people who made a lot of great music. It's very hard to to pick them out. Joni Mitchell. I love lyricists. I love great wordsmiths. Um, so they I guess they're an inspiration, but I don't really rip them off. I, you know, I, I I think of them as precious rather than something I want to emulate. I think of them as something that I'm glad it has existed. You know, and a, and a precious thing in the world. Um, all of those things. Hmm. And then uh, is that a weird, that's, that's probably a very vague answer. I'm sorry. No, no worries. We'll, we'll get you on this one. Uh, are there any <laughs> spe specific artists with whom you'd like to work? I know you have some side projects. I'd love to sing a backing vocal for Peter Gabriel, even if he didn't credit me. I'd love to <laughs> to just put a little, put a little ghost of a thing in, you know, underneath his voice or above his voice. Mm -hmm. That would give me great pleasure. I don't know why, but it would. And and I feel that I probably feel the same about Sting. I'd love to sing a backing vocal on a Sting track. Um, I think. I mean, it's so it's weird how how few artists. Paul, uh, you know, mentioned Sting and pull him out, but he, he's such an, a brilliant, brilliant talent. You know, he's written he's written some amazing songs uh, with with the Police and then Beyond the Police. Um, but uh, I don't know how. I mean, certainly, of course, in the progressive rock area, you're not going to get too many people who are going to admit to to listening to Sting at night, but they should because. Uh, because you know stuff's either good or bad and brilliant or not brilliant. So I'd love to sing with Sting. I would crawl over glass to to have a cup of tea with Joni Mitchell, wh whether or not we worked together. Um, and 
yeah, but I, I, I guess I guess it's those people. A duet with Paul Buchanan would be lovely. Well, good stuff. Well, Steve, I want to pr congratulate you on the new album and thank you for taking the time. You're very welcome. I, I, I hope I managed to sound reasonably intelligent. I'm half asleep. Nah, no worries, mate. <laughs>